be uh, you get an extra point for each pass. So if you make no passes, it's zero. You make one pass, it's one, et cetera, all the way up. So you're incentivizing without taking away from actual gameplay. Right. You know, it, it should complement what you're doing for the rest of the practice. You know, the game should kind of put things into uh, the skills that you just worked on into a game situation so we'll play a game where if i'm trying to get them to move their feet that when they get the puck they have to make an escape move before they can pass or shoot and that automatically makes them move their feet to open space uh, and that sort of thing so i uh, tom uh, talking about what was the word greg block practice and what was the other word distributed distributed i don't know we're trying to interpret those two words and i think we're complicating the game is the game you're going to play and as tom said and tom has vast experience with european coaches having been over there finnish and russian coaches and he's produced a, a manual <laughs> years ago which is really a, a good example of the block Pro block progressions from the very beginning to very advanced stages. And just listening to your question and Tom's answer, I appreciate his ABCs of coaching even more. And it's been published in Austria. And this, this, the simple way I'm trying to, to uh, interpret this information is just keep it simple for the average coach. You've got to practice those skills deliberately to a degree, but they're going to play games even before they're ready. And the game's going to teach. They're going to have to figure out and solve problems on their own. So uh, I really think that's very important. And Tom simply says the game teaches. And the game does teach. But it teaches by the way you structure the games, force them to think, force them to act and ask them questions. So I, I, I see Joe Belfry has joined. Uh, I wish I could stay on the entire morning, but you guys are on a bit of a roll and Mike Benelli is on, you wanna say hockey. Daryl, are you with us or just listening? I don't know if he's gonna participate or not, whether he's on the ice with the Leafs, but I'm gonna have to head over to the hospital right now and uh, you guys are on a roll and uh, keep her going. Jordan, I don't know if you're still on or not. He may have to slip in and out with his kids at a school. But uh, Al, anything to add where we're going here relative to what you're doing? Yeah, I just did a, I just did a comment on that, Wally. I find like, you know, at least at least and I don't know if this is where Tom was going to, but I find like if you if you have the problem and then you kind of work it backwards like with our kids, I find that that's a really good way to kind of in incorporate that more block practice into something that's more productive. You know, like if we were, if we're having a problem, let's say with kids, you know, if we were having a game the other day and the kids were turning into a player and trying to juke them out as opposed to trying to escape and keeping their body between, you know, the puck and the opponent kind of thing. So we did the, we did, worked on the turns, right? Because they were having, had a couple of issues that were, kids were not getting over on their outside edge and their lead foot kind of thing. And, so we worked on the turns first and then we tried, then we started layering on like the things that, you know, they're going to need to use in the game into a more game like thing with, uh, with the keep away. So I don't know. I find that's the, that's the approach that we've been taking. It seems to. I'll just add one thing. <clears throat> in the eighties, when Dave King was practicing, <clears throat> he did very good, uh, block practice. And I know, um, uh, Today, there's a new word called pre-contact or bumping somebody to create space as you have the puck along the boards. Well, Dave had progressions back in the 80s for puck protection. And I believe they're, they're very useful progressions. And I think many people have skipped through them. And now they're doing bumping without they having good stability. And his puck protection progressions and his free puck race progressions like winning the lane 
getting inside position to get the puck and then being able to protect it. And that's where the bumping comes in. So Daryl Belfry has mentioned that. I know the Kim McCullough that's been on really works on that with her minor hockey girls. And they get it. 11-year-olds get it. We were working on it with our national team. Teaching formally the ability to puck protect. And the quite simple way, and I'll share it, is the one player has the puck, a low base. The puck's ahead of their feet. Another player is be behind them to check them. But if you don't do the drill the right way, it won't work. So you have to start stationary with the hands, the, the checking player with a stick on the back, lower back of the player. You've got to feel the player and protect that puck. So if you start separated, and they're behind you, you're looking over your shoulder, you don't learn to protect the puck. So that simple step of you've got to start with contact and the player has to lean back into you and continue to lean and twist the body and use the stick and legs to protect the puck. That's the way you can teach your kids, Al, to protect the puck. But if you just play keep away and expect them to protect the puck, this will help them. It's one of those little tools to add what I call a regression to help them protect the puck better. So that deliberate practice idea is something, uh, it, it doesn't happen. Like they'll get it, they'll get it by trial and error over a period of time, but very few people teach it. And I know it's the same at Hockey Canada and possibly at the USA. How do you teach puck protection and where do you start with elementary, you know, with, you know, first, second, third, fourth year old, you know, old third, fourth year players? Well, they, they got to learn to skate, stand up and be stable before you can. And they got to learn to hold a puck and handle a puck. But not everybody can teach that. So they're learning to do that. More by trial and error, which is fine. But there are parts that can be taught deliberately. And in my era in Hockey Canada, and it was the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association, we developed the right start progressions that to this day, are, I think, are overlooked, bypassed, jumped. And yes, the elite players get it. The double AA, A, triple A's get it. But they don't get it soon enough. So, Bob, I'm wondering if you can remember back to that era, some of those progressions and connect with it. Yeah, well, like you said, I think we always started with with uh, some pressure on the back of the player and the and and taught the player to move away from the pressure. And then as they as they learned to do that, um, then I think it was how to get the puck away from your feet and turn into the puck and keep your body between the the player and the puck and, and to make that escape move. And then along the walls, it was more of, of how to protect yourself from getting like hit or run into the wall. Like what your spacing should be on the wall. You don't want to be three feet out or so. You want to be tighter to the wall where you can protect with your forearm. Uh, and, you know, and you progress, you taught the, the checking part of it and the protection part of it together. And I think this is where a lot of the players as they're getting into body body checking where the problem arises they don't know how to receive the check and I think that's where the where the issue comes in with with uh, this especially the smaller player against the bigger player does not protect himself so I think we we tried to teach the you know to get your your forearm or your or your arms in front and so absorb the check and, and I think it just progressed from there where you once you learn how to absorb the check how to make an escape route or how to how to keep the puck far enough away that they couldn't get stuck on puck um and i think it just you just repeatedly did it and did it and then you worked that into angling where when you started to angle then the guys could learn to to make an evasive move to get away from that angle check mike i'm gonna uh, bring this topic up because of your relationship with usa hockey um i thought we were on the right track progressively teaching um, the skills, 
the contact and body checking game. <clears throat> but there was a in, in the uh, late in the late eighties and early nineties where it became out of hand and insurance rates were going up because they were just hitting and running each other and there was some spinal injuries and and that. And now the way that we're coping with this is we've gone to non-contact and what is the, what is the age level where body checking is allowed in the states? Yeah, so so it's well technically it's 14U, but I think one of the things that I I thought was great what USA Hockey did was was that even in the coaching education program, a lot of the emphasis of body contact is encouraged uh, right from the time the kids step on the ice. You know, there, there's no, so I think, and I think the, the problem that we have articulating that is the difference between body contact and checking. And that's where like a, for a coach, like they don't understand that they're, well, obviously there's going to be body contact and we have to teach as much body contact and body positioning and, and awareness of how to protect yourself the same way. And and a, and the checking part only it actually becomes a whole different skill. So I think you know, for, as far as formal checking goes, open ice, board checking, it was 14U. There's a lot of rules that have been implemented in the last four weeks this year uh, that have really um, thrown a monkey wrench into that as well. Because now, you know, any like the, if the stick comes above the knee. Can't finish your check as a you know in the traditional sense of finishing a check. Um, you know those those rules have been implemented now at th those levels where you know the kids are getting penalties if they're st if they're bladed or sticks even off the ice. Yeah, it's now called uh, competitive contact here in the states. Everything's based around playing the puck in body contact coming off of that. So they, they renamed it, uh, not so much body checking, but competitive contact. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna have to head out, but you guys are on a great track here. I think USA Hockey is ahead of where we are in trying to handle this. Um, and before I leave, I, the NHL is sort of created the conundrum because it used to be the over-aggressiveness and the goons and the way the game was played, it no longer ex exists until the playoffs. And I don't think they become goonish. But because of the size and speed of the game, it's more dangerous in the playoffs because there is body checking. During the season, there's very little hitting or body checking, it's all stick on puck possession and and playing games. So intimidation becomes a factor in the NHL game. The public audience, us, and the kids we coach witness that, and that becomes sort of the norm of expectation for where the game should go. So we have to deal with what goes on outside of us and the role models being established, and now I'm concerned about the standard that the NHL, the inconsistency of it in the playoffs, and it's a fact of life. It's entertaining, but it's different and it's dangerous, and it's it's something that really relates to this topic. So I'm going to leave you guys on, and I think the Canadians are outnumbered today, and that's a good thing. So if we can find out anything uh, in your conversations, and Al. You're in Massachusetts, but you are a Canuck. You've been in Massachusetts a long time. And uh, feel free to pop in. I have got to head out now, guys. So take care. And uh, I only recorded about the first 10 minutes of this. So 